Good evening. Welcome to Catholic Theological Union. I am Sister Barbara Reed, president of CTU, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Winter Shapiro Lecture. The Catholic Jewish Studies Program hosts three Shapiro Lectures each year at CTU, made possible through the generosity of the Shapiro Family Foundation in Boston. For many decades, they have enabled CTU to invite world-renowned scholars to speak on a range of topics related to theology, current issues, and culture. For those of you who may be new to CTU, we were founded in 1968 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, which issued the groundbreaking document Nostra Etate, the Declaration on the Relation of the Church with Non-Christian Religions. Since our founding, CTU has been very committed to interreligious dialogue, especially through our Catholic Jewish Studies and Catholic Muslim Studies programs. We are grateful for the leadership of Father John Polakowski and Rabbi Chaim Perlmuter of Blessed Memory, two of our founding faculty members who established the Catholic Jewish Studies program and who launched the deep and lasting friendships that have been formed between CTU and our Jewish partners in the last five plus decades. In 2001, CTU established a chair in Jewish studies made possible by a most generous gift of Lester and Renee Crown and Patrick and Shirley Ryan. The chair has been held since 2014 by Dr. Malka Zeiger Simkovich, who also directs the Catholic Jewish Studies program at CTU. I now ask Dr. Simkovich to introduce our esteemed guest lecturer. Thank you, Sister Barbara, and good evening. I'm Malka Simkovich, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's Winter Shapiro Lecture, our second Shapiro Lecture of the year. And I'm thrilled to see that we have friends in attendance tonight from all over the world to hear our featured speaker, Dr. Donna Fishkin. Dr. Fishkin is Associate Professor of Humanities at Truro University's Lander College for Women and Graduate School for Jewish Studies. She received an MA and PhD from New York University in History and Jewish Studies and is currently working on two projects in addition of Emmanuel of Rome's Commentary on Ecclesiastes and an archival project about medieval Jews of La Marche, a region in Italy. Her book, Bridging Worlds, Poetry and Philosophy in the Works of Emmanuel of Rome, will be published by Wayne State University Press this May. Dr. Fishkin teaches adult learners at numerous programs throughout North America and Israel, including the Wexner Heritage Program. Uh, she's also the mother of five kids. I do not know how she does it, but she manages to do everything with a, a plum and success. Um, we will leave aside time for questions at the end of the hour, but feel free to post questions in the chat box anytime throughout the lecture, or you can send them directly to me. I will then direct some of these questions to Dr. Fishkin at the end of the lecture. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Donna Fishkin. Thank you so much for having me. Really, this is such a pleasure for me to be able to share my work with the CTU community and also the larger community uh, affiliated with CTU and beyond. Before I start, I just want to say a really special thank you to Dr. Malka Simkovich for this invitation. Thank you to Sister Barbara Reed. Thank you to Professor Stephen Millies, who directs the Bernadine Center. Thank you to Peter Cunningham for all his technological help and assistance. And thank you to Dean Ferdinand Okori as well. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Tonight, I'm going to speak about a medieval poet, Emmanuel of Rome, and I'm going to share my screen. And I just want to apologize in advance. I'm using two screens. So if I'm not constantly looking at you, it's just to make sure where I am in the presentation so that we're not lost. So with that, can we see everyone? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Tonight, I'm going to introduce you to a medieval Jewish poet named Emmanuel of Rome. Emmanuel is the ideal figure to present at an interfaith talk because he was a Roman Jew who was deeply familiar with classical Jewish texts, the Bible and rabbinic writings, 
but also with contemporary Italian texts, both popular cultural material, as we would think of as pop culture material, and Christian theological writings that were grabbing people's attention in late medieval Italy. Like many people throughout history, um, Emmanuel uh, imagined the contours of the netherworld. What happens to a person after the body dies? As evident here on this slide, he was neither the first nor the last person to bring the afterlife into common conversations. And yet Emmanuel's particular imaginative tale is notable because as a Hebrew text, it carries the weight of traditional Jewish spiritual ideas about, oops, about the afterlife, crafted by rabbinic elites over the course of centuries and in dialogue with various interpretations of Hebrew scripture. And yet it is also local to the Italian peninsula where a brand new imaginative rendering of the afterlife had been circulating in a vernacular dialect of Italian, the language spoken by the common people. The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri circulated between 1310 and 1322, and it became wildly popular very quickly. We know this because it was cited in vernacular preacher's sermons already by the mid 1300s. And if you've ever heard uh, a sermon, you'll, you'll, you'll understand, you'll know that really the, the goal is to grab your audience's attention, right? And to deliver a meaningful message. And sometimes we can see that sermons really, you know, good sermons try to keep up with the current events as well. And so the way that we can know through these sermons that the Divine Comedy had already become popular was because uh, preachers were using examples from the Divine Comedy, assuming that there was general knowledge about this text. The story begins with a character uh, named Dante, who was lost in a forest midway through his life. To get out of this forest, he must follow a spirit guide, the Roman poet Virgil. And here I brought you a little snippet from a medieval manuscript to the left here at the bottom, where you see Dante in the blue and Virgil in the red. Um, he follows this Roman poet Virgil who takes him through hell and purgatory. From there, Dante is guided onward by a Christian spirit because non-Christians can't enter the celestial paradise. So he is led by Beatrice, who's a woman unconnected to Dante personally, but is immortalized in Dante's love poetry. And that's in the middle, um, the middle image here, as you can see. Uh, you have Dante on um, my left, uh, to the left of the moon, and, and Beatrice to the right. Each canticle of this narrative poem ends with the traveler seeing the stars. And although Dante reaches the very depths of the celestial realm, he's ultimately barred from envisaging God because of his, Dante's humanity, because of his corporeality. Now with that firm grasp of the comedy, let us turn to Emmanuel of Rome and examine his netherworldly tour. And before we do that, I just wanna show you uh, different perceptions of Emmanuel of Rome over time. Sorry, I skipped over this. So I, just to give you two, one uh, early modern perception and one contemporary perception. The early modern perception comes to us from a legal code, a Jewish legal code that was compiled in the 16th century. It's called the Shulchan Aruch or the set table. And in this legal code, the author Rabbi, um, Rabbi Joseph Caro writes on the Sabbath on Shabbat, one may not read secular books of phrases and parables, books of passion, such as Emmanuel and war books. So this is a, um, a legal code that was a 16th century legal code, and it calls out Emmanuel's book by name. It's the only title that is mentioned in this enormous legal code. One may not read them, these books, during the week as well because it is, quote, sitting of scoffers, right? It's this, this um, embarrassing situation. And because one is removing God from one's mind. Uh, books of passion have an extra prohibition. So this would be, you know, erotica, love poetry, things like that. 
um, they have the extra prohibition of arousing one's evil inclination. And therefore, the authors, the duplicators, meaning the copyists, and of course, the publishers cause the masses to sin. And so we know from the 16th century that there is a ban on reading the works of Emmanuel of Rome. And at the end of the talk, I, I will engage a little bit with this concept of banning Emmanuel's works, but I just wanted to introduce that to you before we got started. And the other um, snippet that I included here is actually an, a snippet from the Jerusalem Post, which is a contemporary publication out of Israel. Um, and the, the title of the article here is Emmanuel of Rome, the Jewish Dante. And I'm going to talk tonight about this question of the Jewish Dante. So we don't know much biographical information about Emmanuel. We know that he was from the Italian peninsula, and we know that he was alive when Dante's Divine Comedy was already written, so in the 1300s. We know this because of his Hebrew celestial tour, which he called A Tale of Hell and Eden, which is the final chapter of his self-organized poetic anthology called The Compositions of Emmanuel, Machberot Emmanuel in Hebrew. Since the 11th century in Spain, Jews had been composing secular Hebrew poetry, which was a major innovation in Jewish literature. Now, to be clear, Hebrew poetry is found in the Bible and was also composed uh, for liturgical purposes throughout the rabbinic period from the second to the fifth century CE. But it was always composed for religious or liturgical purposes. So what is new starting in the 11th century for the Iberian Jews, the Iberian Jews for the first time were writing verse for all sorts of secular purposes. So for example, to praise or eulogize a patron or friend, to remark about the beauty of nature, to register feelings of anxiety before or during wartime, to compliment someone's physical stature. And they wrote all these poems in Hebrew, a language which no one spoke in the Middle Ages. So it was entirely a literary language. By Emmanuel's lifetime in the 14th century, the Iberian paradigm of writing this secular poetry, but using Hebrew of the Bible and rabbinic literature to write it because there were there was no vocabulary other there was no Hebrew vocabulary other than the verses, the biblical verses and the, the rabbinic literature that had been written in the land of Israel. So by Emmanuel's life, this paradigm had already become a stock model, even with celebrity poets and celebrity poems. So that when Emmanuel expresses his vision of the afterlife in a Hebrew poem, this is not really a shocking or even a strange event. What is fascinating, though, is his poem's engagement with Dante's divine comedy. Now, I personally wouldn't call him the Jewish Dante because I think his poem distills Jewish philosophical ideas for a more popular audience. So to be clear, I think that he his goal was not to imitate the divine comedy uh, alone. That was not his sole um, aim or goal. I think that he was trying to do something um, in the realm of Jewish philosophy and make Jewish philosophical ideas uh, accessible to a popular audience. But the way he entangles his poem with Dante's is quite remarkable and creative. And I'd like to demonstrate this through two examples. Uh, before we do that, I just want to um, talk just briefly about what Emmanuel wrote and, uh, and the methodology that I use when I study him. So Emmanuel wrote in kind of four big categories. He wrote books on the Hebrew language, as you can see here. One is dedicated to the shapes of the Hebrew letters and the significance of those shapes. And the other one is dedicated to Hebrew grammar. So much so that we have um, a we have evidence in the early modern period um, from a student of Hebrew who writes that if you want to understand the Hebrew of the Bible, you need to use this book of Emmanuel's in order to illuminate the Hebrew grammar. So he's got those books. He also has one freestanding letter, which is an invective letter, so pretty sharp words to a recipient who may or may not have been named Hillel. 
That's another story for another time. And then he also has a pretty remarkable collection of biblical exegesis. So commentaries that he wrote on biblical books. Um, the ones that we have, um, that we still have, he claims to have written commentaries on all the books of the Bible, but the ones that we actually have are the commentaries on the Pentateuch or the five books, um, the major prophets. So we have um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, just little snippets of that. We have a full commentary on Job, a full commentary on Psalms, a full commentary on Proverbs, and full commentaries on the five scrolls as well. And then the, I would say, uh, maybe equally as large as the, his biblical exegesis, equally as um, prolific in biblical exegesis was his poetry. And Emmanuel's poetry is really fascinating because it is all, well, not all in Hebrew. He has both Italian poems and Hebrew poems. And his Hebrew um, poetic anthology contains the earliest examples of sonnets in Hebrew. So the sonnet form was a form, was a poetic form which emerged in Southern Italy out of the Neapolitan court and sort of uh, made its way northward up into the rest of the peninsula um, from the 12th century onward. And Emmanuel's writings are the first example that we have of sonnets in any other language other than Italian. So it's interesting that Hebrew is really the first language to imitate the sonnet, uh, but it is Emmanuel of Rome who likely is the one who transfers it over. So we have those, and those sonnets are contained in this anthology that is called the Compositions of Emmanuel. And it's, as I said, it's a self-organized anthology. Now, my methodology that I call reading Emmanuel with Emmanuel is um, I, I, di I devised it really, so I would say somewhat organically because Emmanuel's poetry is all written in Hebrew. And as I mentioned, the Hebrew that medieval poets were using was, was taken from the Bible. So basically what they do is they take biblical verses that, that have some sort of connection to what they're trying to talk about. They blend them up. They, they kind of shake them up to take little phrases from one verse and mix it in with a phrase from another verse or with a word from another verse. And through that kind of pastiche, they craft the message or the image that they're trying to convey. And so because Emmanuel has such copious biblical commentaries, I was able to, I, to find words in his poetry or images in his poetry that came directly from his commentaries. And so it's a method that I call reading Emmanuel with Emmanuel, which actually I borrow this this uh, method, so to speak, or the terminology for this method from Dante's son, Pietro di Dante. Um, Pietro di Dante was Dante Alighieri's earliest commentator. He wrote a commentary on his father's um, divine comedy. And when people had questions about words that Dante used in the divine comedy, what Pietro would do is look at those words elsewhere in Dante's corpus. And so it was interesting to me that it was a methodology that I sort of developed organically on my own. And then at the end of, you know, coming to closer to finishing this book about Emmanuel of Rome, I somehow stumbled on this as, as connected to Dante's son. And I thought to myself, this is perfect. This is exactly what I, what, you know, what, what I'm talking about. And so I, I borrowed that. And tonight we'll be talking really about the biblical exegesis and the poetry. Okay, so let's talk about these two examples. The first example is the gate of hell. Dante, Dante arrives at a gateway to hell and the gateway has this um, phrase above it. Here I, I kind of spliced between two pictures, between a medieval manuscript and a modern image. Um, Abandon hope, all you who enter, right? Now, the modern image uh, is taken from the lintel of a fraternity house at Columbia University that has this painted above its doorway. Um, and Dante's Gateway to Hell announces that these travelers have to abandon hope if they're going to come through the gate into hell. And what we see is that in Emmanuel's celestial tour, he also has a gate. His gate is called the Gate of Shalechet, um, which is the gate of dispersal. And he, in his poem, 
He writes, when we finally reached a rickety bridge with a stream flowing under it, it was as though the stream snatched up and pinched the heart of the onlookers. Then my soul began to wither. At the top of the bridge stood a gate where the revolving sword blazed. The man said to me, and that's his, that's uh, Emmanuel's guide. Uh, his spirit guide is named Daniel. So this man, Daniel, said to the character who is Emmanuel, this is called the gate of Shalechet, where all who depart from the world to find their station in hell come this way. Were we not to move from here for an hour or two, we would see those who have departed the world in multitudes. They would cover the surface of the earth twice over. Oh, how the angels of death lead them to a land of waste and desolation. After that, we shall query them about their pitfalls and you shall see their fate. There is nothing surprising about their misery, their tremendous ruin, or their pain, for they are a perverse generation among whom I would not trust my sons. Thus the angel's swords shall strike them in their hearts. While sitting there, listening to reverberations of terror, we were stunned by a sound resembling an anguished woman. In unison, the souls said, our hope is lost, we have been judged. So just to get a little bit of context about what, what Emmanuel is splicing together here. Shar Shalechet, the Shalechet gate, is a name of a biblical gate. And it's one of the gates to Jerusalem, right? And we hear about it in the Bible in 1 Chronicles 26, 16, in a very neutral verse, which just tells us about the various gates to enter Jerusalem. And while this was the name of a biblical gate, the Hebrew root of this term shalechet also means to cast off, to fell a tree. Uh, it is a connotation, um, it's a literary connotation for autumn because the leaves fall from the trees. And so the name, in addition to being a physical gate that was known in Jerusalem, it also refers to the dispersal of leaves from a tree, which aptly fits the displacement of sinful souls from their bodies as they pass through this gate. Like the Dante Traveler, our Traveler character, who's also named Emmanuel, hears the shrill voice of the souls howling, our hope is lost, we have been banished, right? And I ask you to recall the, the sentence above the gate, Dante's gate of hell, abandon hope, all you who enter. In Emmanuel's poem, this, our hope is lost, we have been judged, or we have been banished, um, is a phrase from Ezekiel. Uh, and sorry about the variations of the translations. I took translations from different places. And so in Ezekiel, in the vision of the dry bones rising again, Ezekiel tells us that he received a vision in which he was told, O mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. We are doomed right? Our hope is lost. We have been banished, something like that. And this is a, in, in my opinion, this is a very potent image because it simultaneously acknowledges rabbinic discussions about this Hebrew term shalechet or casting off, right? There are rabbinic discussions about what this means and why the gate was named this, this name. So it does that. This, this, you know, this image sort of captures that gate and those discussions about the gate and the Hebrew word, while it also recalls an expression of despair in its original source in the Hebrew Bible, which is Ezekiel, while also providing an analog to Dante's comedy. Because just like Dante and Virgil uh, come to a gate in order to enter hell, so too Emmanuel and his guide Daniel come to a gate to enter hell. So Emmanuel has thus taken Dante's gate with its inscription and created his own Jewish version of that through a kind of adoption of disparate images and verses from the Hebrew Bible. But that's not all, there's more. Uh, what's going on here, sorry. Okay. Recall that Emmanuel also wrote biblical commentaries in addition to his poetry. In one of those commentaries, Emmanuel uses this verse from Ezekiel, this Ezekiel 37, 11, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are doomed, to illuminate the meaning of another biblical verse. 
from Proverbs 15, 11, which is Sheol and Abaddon. These are uh, interpreted as names for hell, lie exposed to the Lord, how much more the minds of men. And in Emmanuel's commentary, he expounds this verse from Proverbs 15 as a confirmation of God's omniscience, explaining that he, Solomon, the author of Proverbs, says that even though Sheol and Abaddon are esoteric and hidden matters, they are exposed before God. This means that individuals who descended to Sheol and those who lost all hope are apparent before him, God. Moreover, living individuals who have not descended to Sheol are apparent and known before him, the Blessed One. One who died should not think that he has escaped. For those that are in Sheol, after their deaths, whose hope has been lost, and they've been banished from the land of the living, have not escaped his hand. They are before God to reap the fruit of their deeds. So Emmanuel reads the Proverbs verse as comforting the spirits of the dead by its reference to resurrection and affirming God's omnipotence to the living, imparting the belief that God does not abandon the dead. But this reading and its message are found in an obscure biblical commentary reserved for Torah scholars alone. Well, then we cue the celestial tale where weighty theological points are woven into enthralling images and sympathetic characters who happen to align with the most popular Italian tale about the afterlife. Now, my second example, jumping to the final lines of Emmanuel's celestial tale, the traveler Emmanuel beseeches God. May the hearts, so he, he begs that as his tale is coming to a close, um, may the hearts of the generous God's people be nourished by my discourse, right? May I not be compared to one who composes music for the dead or one who howls at the dead. Here I am praying that as long as there's life in me, I shall merit to learn and to teach, to observe and to perform. At my end, may divine kindness be right beside me, sustaining me. May it give honor to the place where I shall be stationed alongside those who lead the many to righteousness forever and ever like the stars. Emmanuel draws a phrase, oops, sorry, from Daniel 12, 3. He ends his celestial journey with a prayer for immortality, an especially pregnant image for any Jew familiar with Dante's comedy, where all three of the canticles, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, each end with the words, le stelle, the stars. Daniel 12, 3 has practical resonance also for medieval Jews. So first, I just want to um, bring your attention to the verse in Daniel, and the knowledgeable will be radiant like the bright expanse of sky, and those who lead the many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. So Emmanuel has taken this verse because it has this term, the stars, and he has used it to end his own celestial tour. These are the last lines of his celestial tour. And so you can see that just like Dante's tour ends with the word, the stars, Emmanuel's does too, but Emmanuel's comes from a biblical verse. Now, Daniel 12, three also has practical resonance for medieval Jews who used this verse as a scribal formula commonly found in the colophons of medieval Hebrew texts to bless the scribe and his family. So a colophon, for those who might not know, is a formula that is usually found at the end of a text where a scribe who has written the text tells the world, uh, you know, the scribe's name, um, the date that the text was completed, what this work is, why this work came to be. So sometimes we'll get really important information about patronage from these colophons. Um, sometimes works are written uh, in, in memory of someone or in honor of a specific event. So they also serve as really neat little snippets of information for, uh, for historians to examine and to use. But in Italy, there is a specific custom of using the verse from Daniel 12, 3 in the colophon of uh, medieval Hebrew texts that were copied. And so 
I brought you just the translation of this part in the Hebrew manuscript. May God reward me and my descendants to study this holy text. Amen. And may the portion of the scribe, Yakutiel, that's this scribe's name who wrote this manuscript, be concealed with those who lead the many to righteousness forever more like the stars. Amen and amen. Right. So it's this kind of prayer uh, that the scribe um, offers at the end of writing a manuscript. Emmanuel refers to Daniel 12.3 often in his biblical commentaries as a shorthand reference to the soul's eternal delights after death. In his gloss on Proverbs 24.20, Emmanuel con contrasts the eternal fates of the wicked and the righteous. And he states, the righteous soul will shine and radiate like the splendor of the firmament and the stars forever and ever. So here we see the very same verse that ends his celestial tour, the very same verse that also is used by Italian Jews to end their writing, <clears throat> excuse me, their writing of books also appears uh, and is, um, is examined kind of from a philosophical perspective. Because the verse that Emmanuel is commenting on, Proverbs 24, 20, says, for there is no future for the evil man, the lamp of the wicked goes out, right? And so Emmanuel explains this as um, using that image of the lamp, the lamp of the wicked, he contrasts the, the, as I said, the fate of the wicked, right? Their light is going to extinguish, but the light of the righteous will shine on. And so he says, uh, as we see here, that the righteous soul will shine and radiate like the splendor of the firmament and the stars forever and ever. Again, using Daniel um, 12, 3. Uh, and it, he says that the soul of the righteous will savor all that it has accomplished. The wicked soul will remain in darkness and gloom, judged in accordance with its iniquity. So Emmanuel also incorporates the same phrase, right? He uses this same, um, I guess we can call it an excerpt from a verse, an excerpt from Daniel 12, 3 throughout his commentaries. So for example, he comments on Psalm 118, 26. And there he says that, quote, light is synonymous with eternal reward. Since the righteous souls shall, sh shall shine like the splendor of the firmament and those who lead the many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. He uses it over and over again throughout his commentaries. And for Emmanuel, Emmanuel of Rome was a not a direct student, but an indirect disciple of Maimonides, who was a very uh, famous medieval Jewish philosopher from who ended up living in Egypt. He was he started out in the Iberian Peninsula, ended up in Fustat in Old Cairo. And what Maimonides did was he proposed a novel way to um, to look at uh, Jewish tradition, uh, and that is through a kind of philosophical and scientific lens. What Maimonides sought to do is to harmonize the divinely revealed tradition of the Torah with the bodies of knowledge, so to speak, uh, from the world of philosophy and science. And this creates nothing short of an intellectual and spiritual revolution for medieval Jews. Um, and what is important for Emmanuel is this idea that immortality of the soul and this is directly taken from Maimonides, immortality of the soul is an intellectual immortality. The, not the whole soul is, is immortal um, after death, just the intellectual part or the rational part of the soul remains immortal because it alone in acquiring truths and acquiring philosophical truths, those truths are, um, you know, perfect, immortal, unchanging truths. And so only in the 
um, connection between the rational part of a person's soul and between those truths. Only with the, the acquisition of them can one can that part of the soul be rendered immortal. And so Emmanuel's immortality, as he expresses it in his philosophical writings, in the biblical commentaries, is an immaterial immortality or an intellectual immortality. And yet he wrote this poem, which is a very corporeal, um, a corporeal rendering of the afterlife with geographical and topographical features, right? So we've got one thinker here who is doing two very different things in his philosophical writings in the biblical exegesis, because both of them, he expresses his philosophical ideas through glossing the biblical text. And there he's able to really stick to the Maimonidean concept of an intellectual immortality. But in his poem, he really embraces this idea of uh, you know, heaven and hell as being real places with, soul, with souls in both of them, but souls experiencing some sort of material reward or punishment. So for Emmanuel, this verse of Daniel 12, 3 is a really important verse because it is both a proof text and shorthand for the righteous soul's eternal reward after death. But it also carries the acknowledgement of Dante's concluding lines in the comedy. So this is yet another example of a hefty spiritual concept, immortality of the soul, which, as I said, is discussed at length in Emmanuel's philosophical commentaries. But it's and it's alluded to. It's not fully discussed, but it is alluded to by the accessible narrative of Emmanuel's celestial tour. Now, it is understandable that some of you may have glanced at tonight's topic and wondered how much is there to learn from one medieval man who wrote one poem, although an excellent poem about the netherworld. <laughs> I would submit to you that Emmanuel of Rome offers us a valuable lens through which to examine processes of Jewish identification, both in the Middle Ages as well as in modernity. Historically, scholars of Jewish history approached Emmanuel of Rome with great enthusiasm, often taking his poetic corpus and using it to imagine a full biography. And here I brought you some quotes from different historians throughout the ages about, uh, about Emmanuel. So as you can see here, um, uh, Saul Chernikovsky calls him Dante's younger brother in talent and close relative in the kinship of poetic spirit. Um, in the 1890s, in, an Irish scholar named Joseph Hotzner wrote that, um, that Emmanuel was a humorist and friend of Dante. Both of them, Dante and Emmanuel, propagate liberal ideas among their less enlightened countrymen and to induce them to shake off the yoke of the dominant church by which they were just then most heavily pressed, right? It sounds severe. Uh, other scholars, um, Hyman Anilo calls uh, Emmanuel the wonder of all times, an anomaly in the Jewish society of the Middle Ages. Why are scholars so excited about him? What, what, is, what is this about? For Jewish historians in Germany, who themselves were advocating for Jews to become German citizens in the 19th century, Emmanuel represents a model of the ideal Jew. This is Enelo's comment. He's an anomaly in the Jewish society of the Middle Ages. Because by the 19th century, Jews had come to think of medieval Jews as being backward and not really knowledgeable about anything other than a very small number of Jewish texts. And so for those German Jews who were advocating to become citizens, Emmanuel represents this model. He's conversant and comfortable with Jewish classical writings, just as much as he's conversant and comfortable with Dante's very Christian poem. And so for Italian Jews, Emmanuel served as proof that Jews had been part of the DNA of Italian identity since the Middle Ages and earlier. 
Dante is known as one of the three crowns, the, the, the three poets, the three authors um, who gave birth to the Italian language. So the myth of Emmanuel and Dante as friends proliferated, fed by Jews who were eager to identify themselves as organic citizens of Europe. This myth is ultimately busted in the 1960s because there's absolutely not a shred of proof that Emmanuel and Dante ever knew each other. So where does this leave us? I submit that Emmanuel's method displays how ideas were organically shared in, the, in an atmosphere where both Jews and Christians lived. Uh, in fact, I brought you the quote from Cecil Roth here at the bottom of the slide, who calls Emmanuel basically a son of the new age, who reflects the spirit of the Italian Renaissance more vividly than any other Hebrew writer. So I, I hope you sense the excitement with which these scholars approach this topic. Rather than posing the relationship of the comedy as the paradigm, which Emmanuel modified, I prefer to see Emmanuel's poem as proof that Jews and Christians of the Italian peninsula were culturally united, even if they were religiously divided. And one of the words that I've heard that really sort of captures this for me is the term atmospheric, where we talk about culture as being atmospheric, that people of varying religions are all breathing the same kind of cultural air. And even though they are, they differ on, you know, points major and minor in terms of religion, in terms of theology, the, the, they are doing so, they are differing from one another, they are uh, debating within one shared cultural atmosphere. And I think that Emmanuel's poem really gives us a window into that phenomenon. And just um, to end here with a bigger question, right? Because we can't just stop with one man and one poem. How should one think about Jews in medieval Christendom? Uh, and specifically, I think that Italy serves as a wonderful, or I should say the Italian peninsula, because of course Italy doesn't exist yet in the Middle Ages, um, serves us as a wonderful example of this. And this is from a professor, uh, Ruven Bonfil, um, emeritus at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who writes, rather than thinking primarily in terms of the influence of the surroundings on the Jews and their conscious borrowing and assimilation, Instead, one should posit an acceptance of the surroundings as representing the natural, unselfconscious way of doing things, realizing that the Jews maintained their identity because they considered the essence of Judaism to lie not in a cultural differentiation from Christianity, but rather in a religious differentiation. So only those patterns of thought that were considered to be specific organic characteristics of Christianity had to be rejected. And I think that this quote really sums it up so neatly that Emmanuel of Rome was not looking at Dante's poem and saying, how can I copy this and uh, sort of modify it for my readership or for my audience, but rather he was in an environment in which Dante's poem had already um, already become you know authoritative to some extent taken the the imaginations of all the people uh on the ground so to speak uh, including Emmanuel's and so his poem comes out from a more I would say from more uh, a, an organic perspective or an organic place of using Dante already as an authority to talk about the afterlife thank you so much